position to tell us largely anchor of the fact that uh, certain uh, uh, the coverage of that includes parts of China's northeast. And uh, China says that uh, South Korea has to consider this uh, in terms of renegotiating or reconfiguring this that issue with, with, uh, with US. So uh, with the new leadership in uh, South Korea, uh, there have been reports that uh, the new president is interested to look into this matter. Uh, so how do you think this will uh, turn out and how will this possibly affect uh, South Korea US relations moving forward? The second question has uh, something to do with the U.S. and South Korea relations. Uh, President Trump, in some of his latest pronouncement, says, said that uh, some people in fact, uh, uh, is this the end of the era of strategic patience? I mean, in relation to the North Korea. Uh, this is the end of strategic patience. And uh, this seems to suggest that the U.S. is interested to do more drastic, more urgent action uh, in relation to North Korea. I wonder how is this being received in South Korea? And uh, what kind of measures will, will we expect uh, from South Korea and U.S. in relation to these uh, pronouncements? Thank you. Um, yes. Uh, one of the reasons why Chinese welcomed the presidency of Moon Jae-in was that Moon Jae-in was believed to reconsider that decision to be a part. When I went to China, last year, uh, December 2016, uh, a couple of times, uh, the question that I was being asked was, who Jay is going to do? scrap this decision to be brought back? And who Jay, as a matter of fact, uh, said a couple of times that he would be reconsidering uh, this decision to be brought back. At least uh, he will be delaying the decision to be brought back. And then uh, upon assuming the office, Make the decision to delay the deployment, saying that we will have to conduct a more thorough environmental studies before we finally deploy parts. And that was really well received by Americans. Americans were saying that, well, uh, if you're reconsidering, if you're thinking about that decision, uh, we'll just scrap the whole deal. And that would be, in my personal opinion, was thinking that, well, maybe uh, we should be doing this. And then he went to the United States and met uh, with uh, Trump and said that, I don't worry too much about it. This is pretty much a foregone conclusion. We are conducting this uh, environmental study to, uh, uh, to increase the uh, legitimacy of the decision. I mean, uh, this goes with every policy decision of South Korea. We, we will have to have a due process of, 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 of you know, environmental studies when we uh, deploy new types of weapons. That's what we need to do, but there was really a power of uh, learning studies. And he said that, well, don't worry about it. The deployment is pretty much a formal conclusion. Uh, next year round, uh, there is going to be a deployment. And of course, uh, that pretty much angered Chinese. Uh, Chinese is still uh, vehemently opposed to complete withdrawal. The you know, <coughs> process is going to work. So we're not going to all this uh, retaliatory measures. We will be continuing this uh, retaliation unless you uh, completely withdraw uh, that decision. So that's the status uh, of the relations between South Korea and the U.S. and South Korea and, and China uh, uh, with regard to the bad issues. And in my personal opinion, I mean, this really belongs to uh, our uh, national sovereign defense rights. And, and we propose this condition. Uh, if North Korea's nuclear weapons you know, problem uh, diminishes to a significant extent, then we will be withdrawing power. So the objective of power is to uh, defend ourselves and US forces in Korea against North Korea's uh, threats. Uh, and this should be really undermining the threat of interests of Chinese. The Chinese are concerned with this extent of uh, that they believe that they have the, has the capability of reading the uh, sensitive military sites of China, like you read the, your palms. But that's not true. Uh, this is the, the, the radar uh, that you will have to, this is not reconnaissance radar. So it doesn't really have that long range. Uh, so I, I think the Chinese concern is a little bit overblown. 
uh, I, I think uh, Chinese are thinking of this deployment as, as a step of South Korea to join American missile defense system in the future. Um, but that's a little bit debatable as well. Uh, I don't have time to deal with that. Uh, sure, Trump uh, abandoned uh, strategic patience, uh, that policy of basically a strategic negligence. I have a strategic negligence of the North Korea by the Obama administration, and he said that all the options are on the table. And uh, when he assumed the office, he said that uh, there is going to be a military option, that we are uh, considering a uh, military option in a serious manner, but I don't think that is going to be an option. Preemptive uh, strike, military strike. Actually, this is not really a preemptive military strike. You know, pre there is a difference between preemptive strike and preemptive strike. Preemptive strike is the military strike against uh, enemies' uh, military sites when the, the, the attack is imminent. So you realize that the attack is imminent and you have no option but to launch preemptive strike, to preempt those imminent threats. And that is guaranteed by uh, international law as well. It belongs to your uh, defense right. But what we are talking about right now is preventive strike to prevent uh, further threats posed by North Korea. Like uh, the American war against Iran in 2003 was a preventive strike, a preemptive strike, because uh, uh, the, the Iraqi uh, attack was not imminent. It was a, a war to prevent all the threats. Okay, so what uh, Americans and, 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 and people in South Korea are talking about is this possibility of preventive strike. But right before now, really North Koreans do possess these military capabilities to deter Americans and also South Koreans uh, from launching preventive strikes. <laughs> because they have no weapons. They have missiles. Okay, maybe they cannot retaliate against the United States, but still they can wreak havoc by attacking metropolitan area uh, in South Korea. Uh, and for one day, there will be like uh, 700,000 casualties according to one study. So that's uh, enough of deterrent capability that North Korea possesses. And I, I don't think Americans want to get entangled in uh, military contingent uh, situation on the Korean Peninsula. They are too busy with other things. So uh, that's why I'm saying that you know uh, it'll take some time because uh, you know, North Korea is uh, firing ICBM uh, and uh, Americans are saying that it's, it's not uh, a good time, it's not a high time to talk to North Koreans. And there was a uh, instant uh, in a war year as American students got killed. North Korea. So uh, many Americans are saying that uh, you know, we should be talking to this North Korean regime, but uh, it'll take them some time. But uh, Trump will realize there isn't really any viable option here. You know, North Korea is is uh, is, is notorious for being the land of lousy power statues, according to my friend uh, Peter Chan. And there isn't really any, any uh, viable power statue. So I, I think. Uh, uh, when all is said and done, the uh, Trump administration will be talking to North Koreans. But the real challenge is uh, with what conditions are we going to talk with uh, North Koreans? That is going to be a real challenge. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor Pito. We have any other questions? We have time for maybe around two or three more questions. Good morning, I'm Patrick Daniel from the UPD Humanization Program in Bumana. I have two questions, sir. First, uh, with the balance of power in, the, in our region, shifting to China, which image or lens of international relations do you think will be more useful or relevant to the Philippines and South Korea? Would it be realism or neorealism? Neorealism, globalism, or whatever, or globalism. And the second question: What will South Korea do in the event Japan uh, 
revises or amends its Article 9, Article 9 of its Constitution. Are you, are you from China? <laughs> <laughs> Were you able to get the questions? Um, okay. Yeah, I, I think, um, as I said during my presentation, I have no problem with China becoming the most powerful country in the region. And uh, we are saying that China has been on the rise, but China has risen already. And the problem is that how does China, with this status, with this power, is going to behave in the region? Um, so far, I, I don't think uh, China is behaving like a uh, great power country. I mean, uh, like the uh, great country that they aspire to become. Uh, as Spider-Man once said, you know, with the great power comes with the great responsibility. <laughs> uh, Now, I, I talked to Chinese scholars and government officials that with the inauguration of Trump administration, uh, it is quite natural uh, for the shift of power uh, will become more rapidly changing uh, in favor of, of China because the U.S. Uh, Trump basically gave up on this responsibility of uh, preserving order in the region is non-based uh, regional order. Uh, what matters to Americans is national interests, American interests first. I think it is a good time for Chinese to uh, project this image to uh, member countries in the region that China is going to provide public goods that the Americans have provided so far. Uh, but the way China responded to South Korea's decision to deploy Khan. This was a really minor thing. That's really undermined China's trade and interests. They overreacted by initiating these petty retaliatory measures on becoming a great power country that China aspires to become. So I think that China will really have to work harder uh, to portray itself as the uh, preserver of non-based international order in the region. So far, uh, we don't, that is the reason why we are so uh, uneasy about the rise of China, because we don't know what kind of world that is going to become. How uh, you know, China is going to be? Is it going to be like the, uh, the kind of uh, feudal system that uh, the system we used to have, like a tribunal system that we used to have between China and South Korea? And then we hear that. Uh, so that's the uh, image that China has projected to South Korea so far. And according to this survey that was conducted by ASA Research Institutes, uh, right now the most hated country among South Koreans is China. China has become the most hated country. This is quite surprising because Japan has been there <laughs> all these years. You know, Japan has been the most hated country by South Korea. But China surpassed. <laughs> Japan is the most hated country in West Africa. Yes. That should be an alarming sign for Chinese strategists. Uh, you gotta work harder on your soft power. Uh, so uh, that's that's the image that uh, South, uh, China has projected to South Koreans. Uh, our relationship with Japan, uh, I don't know. Uh, we still have these. Very difficult, uh, should I say, uh, hard feelings, uh, historical ill feelings toward China. It's really surprising that all the things that uh, uh, Japanese colonialists have done to the Philippines, we don't really harbor any you know, hard feelings uh, for the Japan anymore. It's quite surprising. Uh, was the still retain those hard feelings. Uh, my personal opinion is that it is still 
that. Uh, very important for South Korea and Japan to maintain proactive relations because it is in mutual interests of both countries to maintain a positive and proactive relation. And we share a lot. We are both liberal democracies, a vibrant capitalist economy. Uh, it is in our national interests uh, to preserve uh, liberal democracy and our uh, market economy, capitalist economy. Uh, so uh, I think we should apply two track approach uh, to Japan uh, when it comes to uh, cooperation between the governments. We should see a uh, proactive uh, cooperation. But Moon Jae in uh, is saying that we will have to revisit this uh, sex slave agreement that we entered into uh, in, uh, in December 2015. There was a deal that was cut by uh, Abe administration and Akunea administration. Uh, and Lu Jae is saying that we will have to revisit it. Actually, we will have to scrap that deal. I don't think that's a good idea. That history issue should be dealt with uh, by academia, by civil society. But it's not something that the government should uh, meddle into. Uh, you know, this was an official deal uh, between the two countries. And we should keep it that way. Although we do have historical capability for uh, Japan. And historically, uh, and neighboring countries do not really get along with each other very well. You know, you think about religions between, you know, Vietnam and Cambodia, and religion between France and Germany. They don't really get along. But I don't really think that you don't really have to get along with China, I mean, the uh, Japanese. But that doesn't really get prevent us from doing things that are, uh, are mutually uh, beneficial for both countries. And these issues that should be dealt with uh, on separate track by academia, by NGO, and so on and so forth. So my personal opinion is that we will have to keep that deal intact, although that isn't really uh, satisfactory. So we will have to uh, uh, implement two track approach to the Okay, thank you very much. We only have five minutes. So if we could squeeze in like maybe two questions in the five minutes. Good morning, Mr. I'm Teresa from the Aviation Center. Um, can you please give us a background here on the kind of philosophy Moon Jae-in um, believes? Like, how strong is he a believer of democracy? Um, like, for example, he said he supports um, uh, women's and um, LGBT rights, and then suddenly he says um, it's um, too early to, have, to push those um, philosophies in for the military. And um, uh, for the democracy part, um, uh, I think he's reaching out to North Korea, but maybe North Korea, he's not very popular there because he's a supporter of democracy. So um, can you give us a background on his political beliefs, his history, um, his alliances, and all, um, to, to, to see how he will play out in the international field as well? Thank you. I hope Dr. King could do that in like two to three minutes. <laughs> Moon Jae-in is a liberal. Moon Jae-in is a political progressive. Uh, so on this uh, political ideology continuum, uh, I think uh, Moon Jae-in is on the uh, left end of this uh, continuum of uh, political ideology. Uh, so he believes that government uh, will have to assume more of a correct role in terms of uh, correcting uh, social injustices in South Korea. Governments will have to step in and, and, and uh, to remedy the social injustices. Uh, he advocates a bigger role of the government, and he was a uh, human rights lawyer. And but he had been fired by North Korea's human rights situation, but uh, he changed that. And he said that he will bring up human rights issues in North Korea as well. That's a bit of a surprise because uh, while he was the uh, chief of staff for Nomuyan, he was a chief of staff for Nomuyan, uh, late president of South Korea. He had remained a pilot about North Korea's human rights situations. 
because maintaining good relations with North Korea is more important. When you bring up North Korea human rights issues, it's going to damage, it's going to do damage to our relationship with North Koreans. But now he's, he's talking about human rights issues in North Korea and uh, he's all for women's rights, human rights. And so he appointed, uh, my memory serves me correct, uh, seven female ministers for his cabinet. Um, so, uh, I think uh, he's, I don't know, he's a Democrat, uh, but he's enjoying this overwhelming approval rate, like 85% approval rate, and uh, he's going really fast with these, these policies that he wanted to implement, but by doing so, I am worried that he's circumventing uh, due process of checks and balances. Uh, he has shown this tendency to sideline the Congress, the opposition party. Uh, he believes that they are in the way of the opposition party. Uh, so I, I hope that he is paying more attention to how, not not what. Uh, he wants to do a lot of things, and understandably so, but I think uh, he will have to think more about how he can implement those policies that he wants to implement by uh, listening to the opposition parties. Hakkane has a guy, and when Jay promised that he would listen to the opposition party, he would talk to the opposition leaders, and so on and so forth. But since he's enjoying this, like, a, yeah, like a nearly 90%, 85%, and like what Obama, was enjoying, when Obama was enjoying their high approval rate, he didn't really talk to uh, congressional leaders because you know, he, he talked directly to the people. That's what Moon Jae, my person, Moon Jae is doing right now, talking to people and trying to persuade people. And then with that persuasive power, he can sort of uh, go around these uh, checks and balances imposed by the Congress. So on and so forth. But uh, all in all, uh, I think uh, Moon Jae-in has been a good communicator. Uh, you know, I'm saying he's uh, his own point. He's like uh, Obama. I think he's he's emulating. He's copying Obama. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, having lunch with these uh, regular uh, workers in the rural house uh, without jacket. So that style is quite appealing to many South Koreans these days. Something that isn't really difficult to do, but something that Akane hadn't done. Akane dying herself, even close confidence. You know, they to, you know, didn't really have any conversation, close conversation with uh, Akane. So I, I think Moon Jae is going to be more open minded and, and is going to become the is a overall more effective communicator. Uh, that way, I, I think uh, we, we can say that he's, he's more democratic than has Biden. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Of course, I don't think we don't have time anymore. We probably approach Dr. Kim uh, during the break. But for now, we are to award a certificate of authorization to Dr. Kim so that we call Dr. Igor Gonzalez, Director of UPKRC and ABP uh, Tom Cruz to award the certificate of appreciation and a small gift of Dr. For giving his time and his special lecture entitled Inauguration of Moon Jae in Government and Korea's Policy Options during the 2017 UPKRC Workshop and Roundtable. Given this 25th day of July uh, at this uh, venue, signed the rest of the Philippines, Kessel City, and signed by the director. 